Hey, welcome back! Today I'm going to be looking at All's Well That Ends Well, one of Shakespeare's problem plays. And the problem plays are always very interesting because what Shakespeare is doing is he is taking the format of a, a play and then stretching it to its absolute limit. So in this particular play, he's looking at the structure of the comedy. And he creates a comedy for us, but at the end of the comedy, everything feels so stretched that we really are not celebrating the marriage that comes at the end of this comedy. And we're very frustrated with how all of the characters have panned out. And so it's great to study alongside other plays like Measure for Measure or Trollis and Cressida. In some ways it almost seems experimental. And yet, of all of the problem plays, this one is, to me, maybe the most fun. The character Helena is so intense throughout this play uh, that she really is a very fascinating character, even if we are frustrated with the ending. And of course there's the title, All's Well That Ends Well, which I think Shakespeare gets more mileage out of than any of his other titles. Not only does the title feel very ironic by the time we come to the end of this play, because all has ended well, but has it really? But also it becomes a, a mantra that Helena repeats over and over again at the end of the play. She says this exact line multiple times. More on that in just a moment. Another fascinating thing about this play is that it explores the ideas of gender roles as well as social norms. Our two main characters, Helena and Bertram, are supposed to be the two that become a happy couple by the end of this book. And Bertram is trying to be all kinds of manly. He really wants to be just a macho manly man, but he's getting his lessons from the worst possible source. And so then, rather than being a protector of women, he's constantly throwing women away. Rather than being loyal and faithful, he breaks multiple oaths. Rather than being honest, he becomes quite a liar. Instead of being bold and facing the consequences of his actions, he's constantly trying to escape them. And so all of these noble character traits just kind of melt away in Bertram. He's passive and selfish and a jerk. On the other hand, we have Helena, who's a much more engaging character, but who also struggles with her social role and gender role. She tries to keep her social status, but then she gets great ideas about how to fix things and takes matters into her own hands. Early on, she forces Bertram to marry her, which she thinks makes everything work out great, except for the fact that he doesn't want her. And so then she tries to slip into this role of submissive wife after already taking the lead in the relationship. She tries to be passive, she tries to be sweet, she tries to be a supporting wife, and she can't do it. Things fall apart for her very quickly. She keeps trying to accept her lot in life, accept her position, but every time she does, suddenly she gets this idea, and then she reaches out and tries to bend the world to her goals. She's clearly the dominant and proactive one here. And we like her for her strength as a woman, and yet, at the end of the play, we have to ask ourselves the question, is it satisfying when Helena is able to reconstruct the entire world to her desires? Does her strength lead ultimately to her happiness? Okay, so let's look at the plot. The play opens in the court of Rossillon, where Count Bertram, whose father has recently died, is leaving his mother, the Countess, and her ward, Helena, to go present himself to the king. He has now become a ward of the king, now that his father has passed. And so we get an introduction to each of these characters. Bertram is saying goodbye to his mother. He's about to go off to, to the king's court, along with Lord Lefeu. And Lord Lefeu is a character that allows them to have conversations filling in details about what's going on. And we find out that the king is sick with this horrible ulcer, and he has sought all kinds of medical treatment and has been it has all been unsuccessful, and so he has sort of resigned himself to die soon. And we also get the detail that Helena, the young ward of the Countess, is the daughter of a famous, famous doctor who passed away, and now she has been living with the Countess. If only her father, Gerard de Norbon, had been alive, he would have been able to cure the king, but alas, he's dead. And Helena is quietly shedding tears in the background, and, and the Countess attributes it to, you know, the memory of her father. But as the characters leave, we discover that actually Helena is deeply in love with Bertram. But because they're of different social classes, she's got no chance with him. 
And here he is about to leave and go off to the king's court and she won't get to see him anymore and it's breaking her heart. As everyone else steps off stage and Helena reveals this to the audience, in comes this character whose name is Parolis. And Parolis is a phenomenal jerk. This is a guy who's been hanging around with Bertram and he's a terrible influence. Bad friends corrupt good character. And Parolis is everything awful. He is a coward, he's a liar, he is a cheat. He's very much a knave. But he's also one of those people who wears very fancy clothes and looks really good on the outside. And so he has taken Bertram under his wing and taught him all of his bad habits. Bertram continually looks up to Parolis and thinks of him as this great hero because he buys all of Parolis' stories. Helena sees right through him, and they have a little back and forth for a moment about the relative power of men and women. After Parolis walks away, Helena discovers that she can't stop thinking about the king's disease. And her, the, you can see the wheels turning in her mind, but we don't fully get what, where that's going yet. Before we go on, I want to jump back and look at the blessing that the Countess gives to Bertram as he's leaving, because this image is going to be repeated multiple times in Act 1. The Countess says, Be thou blessed. Bertram, and succeed thy father in manners as in shape. Thy blood and virtue contend for empire in thee, and thy goodness share with thy birthright. It's just good wishes for her son, but the first one is important. She says, succeed thy father in manners as in shape. Bertram looks like his father, and now that his father is gone, he has taken the shape of his father, um, carrying his genes on in, in the way that he looks. That image is going to be repeated, but that wish that he would succeed his father's goodness as he succeed his father's shape is important. Because we'll find pretty quickly that Bertram really does not inherit any good qualities from his father, except his face. In scene two is the king's court, and the king has just been talking politics. And this is the king of France, but he also sees over there in Florence there's this war going on. And the king decides not to intervene with this war. There's a lot of hot-headed soldiers who want to go over there. They want to fight in this battle, and the king says, no, we're not taking sides. Uh, we're just sitting back here. Enter Bertram, Le Feu, and Parolis. And the king greets Bertram warmly. Listen to his words as he greets him. He says, youth, thou bearest thy father's face. Frank nature, rather curious than in haste, hath well composed thee. Thy father's moral parts mayst thou inherit too. So again, you look just like your dad. I hope you inherit his moral parts too. The goodness that was inside of him. Ah, uh, bummer. Notice how much we are reiterating that idea before we expose Bertram as an absolute jerk. And then the king reflects for a couple of fairly lengthy speeches on the goodness of Bertram's father. Again, we're establishing that from the beginning. Scene three, we return to the court of Rossillon, where the countess is speaking with her steward and fool. And the fool has this nice back and forth about marriage and about faithfulness, all themes that we're going to explore as we move forward. After the fool exits to go find Helena, the steward tells the countess that he's overheard Helena sighing and talking about Bertram. Then enters Helena, and the countess begins to poke at this information. Helena, of course, does not want to confess that she's in love with the Countess's son because she feels ill-matched. She's not the right social status to be able to pursue this guy, and so she tries to be humble about it. But the Countess knows the truth, and so she ultimately exposes her. But the Countess sees what a valuable young person Helena is, and when Helena ultimately confesses that, yes, she actually did want to go to the court to try to cure the king's illness, and in that way, earn favor from the king, elevating her status enough to where she can actually marry Bertram. The Countess gives her stamp of approval because she sees Helena as a wonderful young person. And even though she's not of the right social class, the Countess sees the true value within Helena, and she doesn't mind being her mother-in-law. And so given hope by the Countess, and with her own ambitions beginning to rise, Helena sets off for the court of the king. Act 2, Scene 1 begins with the king, who is letting some of his soldiers go off to fight in the Florentine Wars. He is not personally sending an army, but some of the soldiers wanted to go. Bertram wants to go, prove himself, because he's been listening to Parolis, but the king says, no, you're staying here. Parolis tempts him to run away from the king and go fight in the war anyway, and Bertram's kind of on the fence about it. Then Le Feu comes in and introduces Helena and suggests that the king 
take the opportunity to listen to her. But the king doesn't want to for multiple reasons. Number one, he's already tried out every doctor. None of them have worked. He's sick to death of doctors. Number two, she's a woman and he's incredibly skeptical. But Helena is determined. She has learned some secret recipes to cure ulcers from her father. She has the knowledge, she has the materials, she can make it happen. She knows she can help the king. So much so that she's willing to lay her life on the line for it. And the king says, all right, if you're willing to bet your life that you can cure me, I'll give it a try. So great risk, but on the other hand, Helena says, if I succeed, would you do me the favor of allowing me to marry whichever of your courtiers I choose? And the king's like, yeah, sure. If thou proceed as high as word, my deed shall match thy deed. Scene two is a quick scene between the countess and the fool. The countess is sending word to the court to see how things are going, and the fool is playing back and forth with clever ways of responding to sentences. It's really mostly a filler scene between the outset of Helena determined to do the miracle and the king actually receiving the miracle. Because in scene three, the king comes in, Lefeu says, Oh, it is a miracle. We thought miracles had ended, but look. And the king comes in and he sits down. He says, Oh, look at what this woman has done for me. She's healed me. It's amazing. And so he calls in his, his court and his, his lords and he says, You can marry any of these guys you want. Fair maid, send forth thine eye, this useful parcel of noble bachelors, stand at my bestowing, or whom both sovereign power and a father's voice I have to use. Thy frank election make, thou hast power to choose, and they none to forsake. And the few is standing over to the side, and Helena goes from one lord to the next, and each of them, she says, would you have me? And each one's like, yeah, yeah, sure. But she says, I hope that you find a, a wonderful wife, but it's not me, and, and walks to each of the lords. Lefeuda can't really hear, and so he thinks that these lords are actually rejecting her. And finally, she stands before Bertram and says, Bertram, we can get married! And Bertram's like, no, you're beneath me, woman! And so suddenly, all of his ill manners that he's picking up from Parolis really come to light. Helen says, I dare not say I take you, but I give me and my service ever whilst I live into your guiding power. This is the man. And the king says, why then, young Bertram, take her. She's thy wife. And Bertram says, my wife, my liege? I shall beseech your highness in such business. Give me leave to use the help of mine own eyes. No. And the king's like, don't you know what she just did for me? And Bertram says, yes, my good lord, but never hope to know why I should marry her. Why does that have to do with me? Why should I have to marry her? And he's snubbing his nose at Helena. And the king gets pretty angry at this, but Bertram is stubborn. No, I'm not going to marry her. No. And Helen, finally, after listening to this for a few minutes, you can just like see her being crushed by this conversation. Ultimately, she says that you are well restored, my lord. I'm glad. Let the rest go. So she says, I'm, I'm just glad I could help you feel better, King. I don't, don't, you don't worry about marrying me to Bertram. It's okay. But the King's like, uh-uh, for my own honor, you are marrying her, Bertram, or you die. And so finally Bertram's like, okay, fine, I'll marry her, uh, if I have to. It's kind of horrible. And as everyone exits, Lefeu and Parolis have a little chat to the side, and Lefeu is kind of disgusted by Parolis's, uh, uncouthness here. The fact that Parolis completely supports Bertram's rejection of Helena takes Lefeu off guard. And so Lefeu begins to recognize how very hollow Parolis is. He becomes the first person to actually do so, other than Helena, who mentioned it from the beginning. And so he begins to be like, I see what you are, Parolis. And then he leaves, and Parolis is kind of miffed at this. And so Parolis goes over and buddies up to Bertram again and says, hey, why don't we just run away to the wars? Then you can reject this wife that you hate. Leave behind the old ball and chain. And so that's what they decide to do. In scene four, Helen is chatting with a fool about the news from the Countess. And in comes Parolis to let Helena know that Bertram is heading out. He has an important errand to run and may be gone for a while. So why don't you go on back to uh, Racion? And so, she's, and so she tries to be a dutiful wife here. and. and and says, is there anything else that I can do for him as his wife? You know, I can just wait for him? And Perlis is like, yeah, you do that. In scene five, Lefeu tries to pull Bertram to the side and say, hey, your buddy over there, Perlis, he's, he's really a jerk. 
He's a coward and a stinker. You don't want to be friends with him. But Bertram just brushes it off. And Helena comes in, at which point Bertram says, Ah, here comes my clog. And she tries to be really respectful, really submissive, good submissive wife. And he's like, I'm heading out. Here's a letter from my mom. Take it to my mom. And she's like, aren't you going to, like, kiss me before you go? He's like, mm-mm, mm-mm, mm-mm. Mm -mm. And away they ride, off to fight in the wars. Get away from this old life. Act three. In Florence, the Duke of Florence greets the soldiers who are coming to help him in his war, and he's excited to see Bertram. In scene two, we jump back to Roussillon, where the Countess receives word that Helena is coming. And she gets a letter from her son, which tells how disgusted he is to have married Helena, and now he's headed off to the wars, and he's not coming back. She's horrified at his actions, and then in comes Helena, who has her own letter. And she is completely stricken, because the letter basically tells her off, says, I don't want anything to do with you. The letter says, When thou canst get the ring upon my finger, which never shall come off, and show me a child begotten of thy body that I am father to, then call me husband. But in such a then I write never. Till I have no wife, I have nothing in France. So Bertram's letter poses this impossible problem. He says, ah, you can't call me a husband until, you know, you have a child by me, until you have, you know, a ring from me. Mm -mm, I'm not really your husband. And until I don't have a wife, I'm not coming back. And Helena is, of course, devastated, and the Countess is incredibly disappointed in her son. She sees Helena as this jewel, and her son as an absolute, absolute jerk. But at the end of the scene, Helena is alone, and she begins to reflect. And she feels the weight of guilt of having driven Bertram away from his home. So although, yeah, Bertram's definitely to blame in all of this, she recognizes how her attempts to take control of the situation ultimately just drove him further away. And so she decides to resolve the problem for him by being submissive and leaving France. She's going to run away, and so that way at least Bertram will feel like he can come home. Scene three shows Bertram rising in the ranks. Jumping to scene four, the Countess gets a letter from Helena, which tells how she's run away. She's gone on a pilgrimage. The Countess is incredibly upset, saying, What angel shall bless this unworthy husband? He cannot thrive unless her prayers, whom heaven delights to hear and loves to grant, reprieve him from the wrath of great, great justice. Write, write, Rinaldo, to this unworthy husband of his wife. Let every word weigh heavy of her worth that he does weigh too light. So she sees the unworthiness of her own son and the worthiness of her daughter-in-law and is much grieved at both of their situations. In scene five, we cut back to Florence where we meet an old widow who has a daughter named Diana. And they're watching the soldiers go by. And we discover that Bertram has been hitting on Diana. The name Diana, of course, is significant here because Diana was the, the goddess of chastity. And as they're talking, in comes Helena. And they greet her as a pilgrim and say, oh, you can stay at our house. And they begin to talk about the soldiers and they begin to talk about Bertram. And Helen hears her own story from them. And she also he hears how her husband Bertram has been trying to seduce Diana. And of course, this is horrible news for her, and as one would imagine, heartbreaking. But it, again, you can begin to see the wheels turning in her head again. And it's almost as if she discovers another solution to her problems. So she's tried to play the passive role, and, but every time she does, she gets an idea. In scene six, uh, several of the lords have, are chatting with Bertram, and they are beginning to expose Parolis and say, Parolis really is a terrible person. He lost his drum, which is like the flag, um, you know, it, it leads the armies, and in the, in the most recent skirmish. And so, um, the, and he'd been bragging about how he's going to get it back. And so they say, let's set a trap for him to expose what an absolute jerk he is. And Bertram, then you'll really see what kind of person he is. And Bertram's like, oh, okay, all right, fine, I'll go along with it, but I don't believe you. And then Bertram heads over to try to, you know, get with Diana again. Scene seven, we cut to Helena, who has told her story to the widow and Diana, and told them everything that, that's happened here. And she says, I have an idea for you all. Why don't you finally give in and agree to sleep with Bertram under certain conditions? But you'll demand from him that you get his ring, his special family ring. And of course, this is, a, this is an incredibly valuable family ring that's been in the family for generations and generations. 
But because he's so, you know, caught up in his heat here, uh, you should be able to get it from him. And then tell him that you'll meet him late at night, and that you won't talk to him, but you'll just let him in and sleep with him. And then we'll do a switcheroo where I'll actually sleep with him as his lawful wife, and he'll think it's you. And I'll give you all this money for your dowry so that you can actually marry somebody worthwhile. That's the plan. Cutting to Act 4. Act 4, Scene 1, several of the soldiers lay a trap, an ambush for Parolas, and as he comes out there and he's trying to think about how he's going to get out of rescuing his drum, he was bragging that he was going to go save his drum and, and he knows he's not going to be able to do it, so he's trying to come up with some clever story to um, keep himself from getting caught for this. When they capture him and tie him up and blindfold him and start speaking in, in gibberish, making him think that he's caught by enemy soldiers. And he immediately tries to confess to absolutely everything, but they take him off and tie him up. In scene two, Bertram is with Diana, and he's, he's trying to really be slick. And Diana finally caves and agrees if he'll give his special ring. And he doesn't want to, but ultimately the temptation is too strong, so he hands her the ring and agrees to meet her in the dark. In scene three, Bertram comes in to meet with the other soldiers who are about to interrogate Paroles. But there's also a lot of news that he's just received. One, he received word that his wife Helena died on a pilgrimage. He's also received the very angry letter from his mom, and he's beginning to realize, I need to get back home again. And he has, already he thinks, slept with Diana. And so the soldiers surround Parolis and they babble a whole lot, and one of them acts as an interpreter and asks him lots of questions, and he spills absolutely everything he can, and he trash talks all of the soldiers in the Duke's army. And they search him and they discover a letter on him where he was chatting back and forth with Diana to try to mess up Bertram. And after he's completely exposed for what a loathsome coward he is, they pull off his blindfold, and he realizes that he's surrounded by all the people that he just sold out. And all of his friends now hate him. But he's also thankful, because he really thought he was just about to die. And so even though he's lost all of his reputation and his credit, he's like, well, I'm alive. <laughs> I guess I'll head back to France. In scene four, Helena, with Diana and her mother, are heading back to the King of France to tell their story to the King of France and get some help from him. She knows that the king will support Helena and also reward Diana. In scene five, the Countess and the Fiore are having a conversation about Bertram. They find that the king is coming to the court here and also that Bertram is coming home. And the Countess is incredibly disappointed in her son. She also has found out that Helena is dead and she's grieving over that. The Fiore tries to soften it saying, well, it was really because he was hanging out with that loathsome Parolis that was that all this has happened. And the Fiore offers his own daughter in marriage to Bertram. And as the scene and act end, the fool comes in and says, Ah, Bertram's at the door, here he comes. Act 5 begins, as Helena arrives at the court of the king and finds he's not there. He's gone on to Rassillon, which messes up her plans a bit. And at this point, she's been strong-arming this whole plot, trying to make things happen. She has found a way to solve Bertram's riddle. She has his ring, she has his child, and she's going to make it happen. She's going to make this end in a comedy. And she begins repeating, in several scenes here, all's well that ends well. I'm gonna make this play into a comedy if it kills me! And so she gears Diana and her mother back up and says, we're heading on another trip. We're going to Rassillon. In scene two, Parolis also arrives at Rassillon, and he finds Le Fieu. And uh, having been exposed, Le Fieu now uh, talks down to him exceedingly. Uh, but Parolis is ready to be a servant. And, uh, and just to serve Le Fieu, just so he has a position. Now that everyone in the world knows who he is. Scene three is the grand conclusion. The king comes in and all of them are reunited here, but they're also all thinking about the tragedies that they've gone through, particularly the loss of Helena. And Bertram is back and he is somewhat disgraced, but he's trying to sell himself well because he was a hero back in the war and he didn't mean for Helena to die, and so he's trying to, to, to talk, you know, with all kinds of humility and, and saying, well, I, I made a bad decision, but I'm sorry now. And they're all beginning to buy it, and he's ready to marry Le Fieu's daughter. And everything seems to be going well, and so Bertram takes off a ring off of his finger and hands it to Le Fieu as a ring for his daughter. However... This ring, they all immediately recognize as not Bertram's ring that he always wears. 
but rather it was the ring that Helena gave him when they were in bed together. And not only did Helena give it to him, but Helena originally got this ring from the king. After doing that huge favor for the king, he gave her this ring and said, if you're ever in need, send this ring to me and I will help you. And so the king immediately recognizes it and says, wait a second, where did you get this ring? Did you steal this from Helena after everything else you did to her? She was supposed to be able to send this to me in her time of need, and you took it from her? And Bertram's like, uh, no, no, I didn't get it from Helena. I, um, I, um, I, um, some lady threw it to me from a window. And when I tried to give it back, she, she just wouldn't take it. And suddenly, all of his stories begin to fall apart, and they begin to suspect that he actually killed Helena. At that moment, in comes a messenger from Diana, saying that she has a petition to the king. And her petition says, Upon his many protestations to marry me when his wife was dead, I blush to say it, he won me. Now is the Count Rossillon a widower. His vows are forfeited to me, and my honors paid to him. He stole from Florence, taking no leave, and I follow him to his country for justice. Grant it me, O king. In you it best lies, otherwise a seducer flourishes, and a poor maid is undone. Diana demands to be able to marry Bertram now. Few is like, another woman here! There's no way I'm marrying my daughter to you, you jerk! And so the king invites Diana and her mother in, and they say, yep, there's Bertram. He promised to marry me. And Bertram now is willing to throw them under the bus. He already ditched Diana and left the, the, the country. But here he's like, no, she's just this, this common prostitute that was among all the camps. I didn't, I didn't do anything. And she says, then how did I get this ring from you? If this ring was so precious, your family heirloom ring, would you give that to a common prostitute? And much like Parolis was earlier exposed, Bertram is now being exposed, and each layer that comes off shows him as a more loathsome person. And his lies just get more and more hollow. And then they invite Parolis in as well, who can confess that Bertram was hitting on Diana all this time and was trying to sleep with her. He knows what went on between them. But then they all come down to the point of the other ring, the ring that Helena had. How did Diana get that ring? And then suddenly Diana becomes very cryptic and begins to sort of double-speak everything she says. She didn't actually sleep with Bertram. She didn't actually give him this ring. She didn't actually... And then they all are becoming very confused. And the king is getting more angry and saying that he's about to lock up Diana. But Diana says, ah, but I have bail. And in comes Helena as her bail. And once everyone sees Helena, all the pieces fall into place. And they recognize it. And Helena says, ha! I solved your riddle! When from my thing you can get this ring, and are by me with child, etc., this is done! Will you be mine now that you are doubly won? I did it again! Boom! I win! The play is a comedy after all! I forced it into a comedy! And yet, at this point, are we satisfied that after all that she's poured in to make this play a comedy, force it into a comedy, solving impossible riddles, overcoming an incredible odds. She's done all this. Yeah, she's won. And yet what has she won? Bertram. What a prize. It's what she wanted all along, but so disappointing that after you've exposed this guy, and he's been exposed before everyone who matters to him, as the most loathsome and worthless man, he may have his father's face, but he has no goodness within him. He's all rot inside. He's a coward, he's a liar, he's a womanizer, he's unfaithful and unreliable in every possible way. And you get him. Congratulations, Helena. It almost seems as though she's so determined to get what she wants, and so determined to win, that she doesn't actually see how empty her ultimate win is. But, go team! Thanks for watching. You can click to subscribe or to watch another video, and I will see you next time. Have a great day. Bye-bye.